We're very pleased to see him uh, with us tonight. Um, uh, Jeremy is going to present a very interesting presentation for us. Jeremy, is a clicker for you? You can just you. click on the next and hold the microphone. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, really pleased to, uh, to be here at the OWASP event, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give you a presentation. Um, having just sat through that one, I'm not that technical expert, so, and because I knew I was going to be speaking in the evening, I kind of decided to make this a little bit more relaxed. So this one isn't going to be as heavy as what you've just had which you might like or you might not, depending on how much you like those sort of deep dives. So this is shallow. This is shallow, I can assure you. Um, right, okay, so I'm going to give you a view from the bridge, um, or more likely a view off the bridge. Um, so I didn't, you know, to try and talk about PCI and try and make it so it sort of gives you some idea what we're doing and try and make a bit of fun, um, I thought the best way to do it is to go through all my holiday photos. So instead of just usually boring my parents, I'm going to bore all of you with my holiday photos. So that's the Norwegian Epic. And it's the first time I've been on a cruise ship. And it was bloody huge. It's got 19 decks or something stupid like that. And we went and sailed around the Mediterranean. And along the way, we stopped off some really nice places. And strangely enough, they kind of fit in. Well, I thought they might fit in with, with some of the things I want to talk about. So. The first place we stopped at was Pisa. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it bloody leads. I didn't realise until I went there how much the Leaning Tower of Pisa actually leads. And I guess that made me think that not everything in life ends up as you originally planned. They didn't plan it to lean, but it did. Um, but it's been there for 640 years. So it kind of still does the intention of what it was. It's a tower. It contains bells, bells ring, and people can go up and look around. So, although it doesn't quite end up where you wanted it to, it nearly did. And sometimes that's how life goes. You know, you start off trying to design something brilliantly, and it kind of migrates a little bit. But if it gets there near enough, then okay. Go with it. Go with the flow. So then we left Pisa and, and we went to Rome. And um, we stopped off to see the Colosseum. And the Colosseum is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And it's like, yeah, if you build it well, it can last 2,000 years. And I'd love security systems to last 2,000 years. In fact, I'd love security systems to last two weeks sometimes. But there you go. Now. It's still there, it's not quite as beautiful. The, the, the guide who was there said, if you want to see where all the marble that used to encase the whole of it has gone, just go down the road to the Vatican and you'll see it all, because they nicked it. But that's how things go. We borrow things off each other, and, and we try and use them and reuse them just to try and get there. So that was, that was the Colosseum. Well worth a visit if you've never been. Uh, ooh, interesting. Okay, so then we went on to um, Pompeii, and Pompeii was just another brilliant, brilliant place. And when I was there, we were walking around, the guard showed us this. This is a mosaic, 2,000 years old, and if you can see it, there's a dog, and it says, Kavek an M, beware of the dog. So the Romans came up first with the signs of beware of the dog. And you're like, oh, okay, so we're not the first. In all of this, wherever we go, we're never the first. Someone's always been there, usually been there first, doing it, and we're sort of just building on it and making sure that it works really, really well, or trying to improve what people have been developing to make it even better. And that's how we look at things from security. We try and just improve things and build on them and try and keep them secure because there's always other people trying to do the opposite. Um, and we weren't the first for fast food. Pompeii is full of all these little shops with these these little dishes here, and what you had was, you had a little fire, a cooking pot, and you'd stop there and you'd go, I'll have a pot of food please. So it's Roman version of McDonald's. Uh, and we also weren't the first to start with bollards. So there's these roads where all the chariots went, and when they wanted to stop, they put some bollards there. Big concrete, well, big stone blocks, not concrete. Uh, and it's like, wow, these people were really clever. 
Um, but you can't always defend against every eventuality. So they built this place, beautiful, by the sea, with a lovely mountain in the background that hadn't erupted ever, and they didn't know it was a volcano. And sometimes, in spite of your best efforts, something out of your control messes you up big time. So for everybody in um, Pompeii, that was a bad day. Their security wasn't good enough. And um, that's how life is. You know, we, we try and make security and we try and make our systems bulletproof. And we can think of nearly every eventuality, but sometimes there's something that's there that you just can't, you just can't take into consideration. Uh, and, and that's what happens. So you've just got to get over it and move on. Unfortunately, obviously, those people did. You know, it's quite interesting to see all of the, 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 the sort of remains of the people. And, and it's very sad in a way, but it's how it is. So where does this all leave us? Um, we. There we are. We are the weakest link. Although, maybe we're the strongest link. Maybe it's not that we're the weakest link. Maybe we, as people, hold everything together. Or maybe it's both. So... In terms of PCI, one of the things we always talk about is people, process, and technology. We always think that you've got to train people to understand what they've got to do. You've got to train people to understand all of the challenges that they need to be aware of. Um, because that these days, they are the front line. We're seeing so many attacks that will target anybody. And we've got to make sure we focus at the very top of organizations because actually the weakest link is our board. We've, I've seen various reports from various security companies and generally if you want to target anybody you target the C-level because they're gullible. They don't understand anything and they will click on that link and they will open that file and they will cause you a problem and they will bring in an iPad and say, oh can I connect this please? And it's difficult to say no to these people because they're your senior bosses. And so you've got to get the people right, you've got to get your processes right. You've got to ensure you know what you're doing and how you're going to do it. And then you've got to get the technology right. And where data security, where payment security is concerned, that changes depending what sector you're in. Because the challenges that the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury's face as multi-lane uh, merchants are very different to the challenges that British Airways and EasyJet face as big airlines. And that's different, again, to the challenges that Hilton Group and Marriott and everyone else face as a hotel chain. So it's a bit different for each of you, and you've got to get it right. And there isn't one solution that fits all. You've kind of got to know what your challenges are, how you work, what applies to you, and what's important to you. Because if we ignore what logic tells us is not right, then we end up with this. So I've now moved off my holiday photos onto my weird collection of photos I take when I'm traveling around the world. So this was a shower in all places in Germany. And this just convinced me that the Germans don't know everything about designing things superbly. So for you who can't see, here's the shower and here's the shower screen. And you don't need to be a genius to know as soon as I turn the shower on, it covers the floor with water. And it did. And I was like, hmm, okay. So, this next one, strangely enough, now I've moved to Spain. And logic told them that putting the shower here with the screen there was a bad idea. And that was really good. It was a bad idea. So now they tried to stretch it from there to there. And you can see where the, cable, where the, where the pipe goes. Now, I'm six foot four. And that kind of got to about my belly button, and it wasn't going to go any higher. So I had a real good shower from about midriff down. Kind of, you know, so they knew it was wrong, but instead of moving the taps, they were like, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but just occasionally, and going back to Germany, sometimes it's just plain wrong. So if you can see this, this is the bed. This here is the bed, and that's the shower. Now, 
it's wrong. It's just wrong to put the shower at the end of the bed. And I looked, I was sat in bed looking at this shower going, why do I want to be sat in bed looking at a shower? I, I, I couldn't quite work it out, but there you go. So sometimes just accept it's wrong and stop and start again. And then we give great advice, caution, hot water, and then we leave it to choice. You've got a 50-50 guess of which is the hot tap with the hot water and which is the cold tap because the vital bit of information isn't quite there. So we're kind of left with that choice. And now actually, knowing those sorts of things, you'd be pretty safe because it wouldn't be hot anyway. But we try, you know, someone at least had the thought, right, I've got to put the sticker on for health and safety, I've done that, and, and this is the difference between compliance and security. I'm compliant because I've got a sticker that says there's hot water. I'm not secure because I haven't got a clue which it applies to. And that's the other thing. When you're doing data security, we've got to get past compliance and try and convince people that it's all about doing security. I'll let you have the slides. You can you can share the slides. <laughs> don't, don't, don't ever you know this this is a this is a post 5 p.m. presentation. This is not what usually happens with my presentations. But what the heck? Go for it. So um, yeah, right. This next one. I was at the NFL games. I love NFL, and I went to NFL Wembley, and I'm watching the game. And and all right, I admit it. I was also watching the the cheerleaders. But then I noticed this bloke. This is the champion of security. Only in Britain would this guy not look at beautiful women in front of him. And he never stopped in his task of looking at the, the fans to make sure that we were not going to be invading his space. So congratulations, you did a great job. Everybody else looked at the ladies. They were very beautiful. All the football, the NFL was good as well. Um, which really kind of brings me on to a bit of the serious stuff. I've done a bit of fun stuff, I'll do the serious stuff. Um, Brexit. Oh my God. If ever there was the worst time for anything to happen, it's now. Because just at the moment, we have got more European regulation coming through that's going to affect data security, data security payment security, payment process, than ever coming out of Europe, and right in the middle of that, we decided that we're gonna leave Europe. And in simple terms, how will this affect, how will this affect us? What will the impact of Brexit be? Not. We are not gonna, nothing's gonna happen. If we ignore what's coming through from Europe, we're gonna be in a big mess. So, um, please ignore the fact we've Brexited, because a lot of this new regulation that's coming through is going to hit us in 2018 and we won't have left Europe by 2018. So uh, we need to get on with it. And as I said, it's all going to hit us in 2018 and the clock is ticking. And I'd actually, I've, I've been careful how I chose this. So I chose this one with great care, 10 past 10, because it's not nearly midnight, it's not 11 o'clock, but it's getting late in the day, and we've got a lot of new regulation that's coming through that's going to impact all of us and all of our organisations, and we need to start doing some work on it. Now, I'm old enough to be a Y2K person, and the company I was at, we spent a lot of time making sure we weren't going to get caught out. Now, I can't tell you whether it was proper, good, bad or indifferent. All I know, we'd made damn sure every one of our systems wasn't going to be affected, and it wasn't. Yeah. So, that's what we've got to do in this, because this is what's coming, and this is bad news, bad news 101. European, data, European General Data Protection Regulation is the most scary bit of regulation I've ever seen, and it's coming. European Payment Services Directive covers how we do and accept payments in Europe. Securing internet payments and interchange fee regulation, and we've also got another one from there, which is a, a technical standard that's coming through that's gonna service the Payment Service Directive too. And that's all bad news. 
it's going to have a massive impact. So the good bits are that all of them talk about security at a very high level. And I love high level because I'm a standards person and we have standards that will tell you. So protecting things in appropriate security, making sure data is appropriately secured, doing things in appropriate manner, that's brilliant. That's what regulators should do. Regulators shouldn't go into detail, they should keep all nice and fluffy and high level. So I, as a PCI guy, can write standards that go, actually, this is how you're going to secure your networks. This is how you're going to secure your payments. And then you can go to the regulator and say, right, we've brought in PCI, we've done it, we've implemented it, I'm now conformant to all of this law. Which is good. The problem is, is they start getting a bit more into detail. And some of the things they are doing is they're getting really, really hot on notification and on penalties and on fines. So um, it used to be good. We used to, so a lot of organizations over the years that we've been doing PCI, and PCI's been around for about 10 years now, they focused on what was important for being compliant with PCI. That was all right, I love that because I'm the PCI guy. So they got the payment data and they secured it. All of the cardholder data, they made that nice and secure. They segmented all of the systems, kept all that away, stopped securing the card, stopped storing the card data, encrypted it, tokened it, brilliant. I love it, it's all nice and secure. All the personal details, they just kind of languished in all of their systems. So most organizations have got tons of personal data, unprotected, unsecure, in their, in their systems. And along comes the GDPR and it says, by the way, if you have a data breach of personal data, then it's not good. And if you have a data breach, you'll like this one, you've got to tell your, your regulator within 72 hours of you becoming aware that you've been breached or you've lost the data. Now, my experience of that is in the first 72 hours of finding you've been breached, you're pretty darn busy trying to find out what the hell's gone on and how bad it is and how big the breach is. Now, you're going to have to call the ICO and go, we've had a breach. Thank you, goodbye. And what that means is you've met that requirement. The ICO is going to get a lot of phone calls from people going, we've been breached. And they're going to go, well, what's happened? Don't know. Well, I've informed you as per your regulation. Um, but this is where it gets really nasty, is um, at the moment, the ICO can give you a £500,000 fine. If you're useless with all of your security and let all the criminals steal everything, the most you can lose at the moment is £500,000. There are some firms in the UK who will be really happy they've been breached now. Because... Come 2018, those are going to shift into these two. So if you're really useless and lose all of your data, or a lot of data, and it's to be defined what a large breach means, but I guess some of those we've seen in the news lately would, clarify, would, would meet that requirement, you can be fined 4% of your global turnover. Now that takes a fine for some large companies from half a million to say 70, 80, 90 million. And if that doesn't get your boss's eyes and ears, or your chief finance officer's eyes and ears, nothing will. So that's why I'm saying you've got to get a lot of work to do to get your data systems for all your personal data that you've got in there secure by the middle of 2018. Now, just to give you an example of what that means in reality, for a company to do PCI, and remember PCI is just looking after the cardholder data, depending on how big your company is, that could take somewhere in the region of two to three years. This is probably twice as big a job, and you've got 18 months. So the time to start doing it was a year ago. Now is late, that's why the clock's at 10 past 10. It, time is ticking on. So this is really, really, really important, and it's not getting enough airtime. Um, actually, we, I think we sit in the middle of all this. I think we 
provide a good level of security that will cover all of those things and, and will really hopefully help you. Um, I'm going to go through change of chat and talk a little bit about some of the changes to our standard. We do update our standard on a regular basis and we made some changes this year to PCI DSS and we released 3.2. And, and really the main release, the main reason for that change was we have made some changes in our requirements relating to um, SSL and TLS, early TLS. So effectively, we used to say in our standard, if you're sending data over a public network, you must encrypt it using a secure process such as, and that was our big failing, we put such as SSL. We only said it three times. And then we went, oh, and then NIST in the wonderful ways went, ah, actually back in 2014 they said, you know what, SSL's done. Can't patch it anymore, it's been broken. So you're going to have to get rid of it. Which is a bit of a challenge for us. So we went round to everybody and said, right, okay, SSL's gone, early TLS is gone, how long does it take to get out of your systems? And all of the guys said, it'll take us about three months. So we said, brilliant, fantastic, have a year. And we released our 3.1 standard last year, April 2015. By July 2015, the first, vent, first merchants had come to me and went, do you know what, when we said three months, we actually meant two years. Uh -huh. And that was because the guys who'd done the three month bit were actually right. You could get it out of your systems in three months. The problem was, most of your companies and organizations would stop working because it was so endemic throughout everything you did and also you'd switch off about 25 to 30 percent of your customers because they can only talk to you using SSL and TLS. So they, when everyone tells us something's wrong we have to change the standard. And this is one of those interesting things where we're back to the Leaning Tower of Pisa uh, and the shower in the wrong place. We know it's not secure but People have got to do business. And so now we're balancing. And we're not in the best place. We know it's not brilliant for balancing, but we accept that people have got to do business. So we've had to let it stay in for an extra two years. And to be perfectly honest, although we've changed the date and pushed it out to June 2018, I'm not entirely convinced come next year that I'm not going to get those same merchants coming back going, do you know what? We're going to need another two years to get rid of it because it's one of those things, it's just there. So it's a challenge. Um, we definitely want to try and get rid of it. We've been telling everyone to start using SL TLS 1.1 operator, probably 1.2, if not better. And actually the problem is not the SSL, it's the early TLS. It's TLS 1.0 that people are going to struggle to get rid of, because it's just all over the place. So kind of one of the things that was key to 3.2 was that. Now, the other thing, we've gone for multi-factor authentication. We used to say, you've got to have two-factor authentication if you're remotely connecting into systems. And people used to come to us and say, honest, I kid you not, I'm using three-factor authentication. Are you telling me to meet the requirements I've got to drop one of those factors? No. So we thought, all right, we'll change it to multi-factor. For those who are using more than two-factor, they'll be happy. Um, and that's really all the difference is. The factors have got to be different. You can't use a password for two, as, you know, two passwords. It's, that's one factor twice. Um, the other thing we've done, and this is going to affect you a lot, is we're fed up of the criminals getting into systems and giving themselves admin rights and then being able to gain access to all of your systems and steal everything. So we've changed the rules around administrative access because... All of your ad, well, a lot of organizations used to have a global admin logon with a username of administrator and a hard to guess password of admin123. And the criminals worked that out. So now we're going to say each administrator's got to have two factor logon whenever they go into the card data environment, which will cause some people some problems. But we've had too many breaches. We've had too many forensic investigations come back and say, they came in, they gave themselves admin privileges, and there they went. So that's why we tend to react when we get a lot of breaches, and that's what's happened here. Um, the service providers, we've always wanted them to improve. 
because these people aggregate cardholder data. So we've wanted to make sure that these guys are doing more to try and make themselves secure and improve security. Especially around when they're using some things like the TLS and the SSL. Um, but also, for these guys, they've got to sort of understand they've still got to be able to support those merchants and other organizations who haven't migrated. So again, we're in this balancing act between security and, and, and doing business. Um, we like to try and get rid of the cardholder data, so we're doing a lot on point-to-point -point encryption. We're trying to use point-to-point -point encryption just to get rid of the cardholder data out of the merchant environment makes life a lot easier and one of the interesting things we're trying to get rid of is is all of these other parties who can gain access into the card data environment we've had some major breaches where the criminals hack in through this and they find a way in to be able to steal the data so if we can encrypt the data at the start um, it's of no use to them so point to point encryption is becoming very very interesting the other thing I've put a couple of slides in is we are in the process of setting up a security, a software security task force. We used to have, a, a, well, we still do have a standard called Payment Application Data Security, which is about securing payment applications. But it was clunky, it wasn't very good, and the world's moved on. And we want to try and improve software security, and one of the things that we also recognize is software changes constantly. So in in implementing a new process, oh, these are the people involved in it. If you want to get involved, do join us. And, and what we're trying to understand is how we can work it out, what are the objectives, but also how can we manage the change process so that we can recognize good practice within an organization so that we can say, okay, when you want to do an update to the software, when you want to do some patches, do it. Tell us you've done it against your standardized process and then inform us that you've done it and we can register it and we can keep it listed. So this is something new for us. Um, we are just starting. So as we get along the way, I'll keep, you know, we, if you keep on abreast of our website, you'll see what's happening. But we do see this as being able to extend across all of the new payment channels, across all of the new technology, and for us to keep an eye on what's going on in the payment space. Um, three-part validation, so full software review, um, software development lifecycle review, software delta review, pretty much what I was just saying. So, in essence, at the end of the day, it's dead easy, PCI DSS. All we've got to do, we've got to keep the bad guys out, and we've got to make sure that we check everything that's going on, and make sure everyone knows what they've got to do, when they've got to do it, and how they're doing it. And if we can manage all of that, then hopefully we'll be in a little bit more of a secure place. And with that, thank you very much. I can smell pizzas. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was speeding up because I saw pizza boxes going past. Well, I think the only thing between uh, Jeremy and the pizza is the questions, right? So I'm pretty sure the vast majority of people in this room are in are either developing software which is processing credit cards uh, or work for organizations which have to comply with PCI DSS or are security guys who have to protect systems which process credit cards. So I'm really sure you're gonna have lots of questions. So questions please. Uh, can you go. Yes, Vicky. in the back. Are you getting past the microphone to Vicky, please? I can't guarantee I'll answer I'll have a go. <laughs> I just want to know a little bit more about the three other um, payment security centres that you listed, because I think there's been a lot of there's been a lot of talk about GDPR. Yes. And then there was the other three, and do those three sit inside PCI 3.2, or are they separate standards? And when are those applicable? And and what do they mean? Good question. Um, so the other three standards there. Um, the, the, the main one that's really coming along is, is the Payment Services Directive number two, which basically says how we're supposed to do business. And that one, next to the GDPR, is the second worst standard I've ever seen. So one of the things that PSD2 is requiring is that you have to have strong customer authentication when you're undertaking 
payment transactions. Now, originally, when they first developed that standard, or that regulation, it was going to apply to e-commerce. But somehow, in the process of releasing it and rewriting it and changing it, they changed it to, this applies to all electronic transactions, which kind of means every transaction. So, at the moment, if we just ignore the fact that all of our face-to-face -face transactions aren't going to mean that, necessarily, especially when we start doing contactless, uh, and I'm not sure what we're going to do, what it also means is a lot of the brilliant new techniques that we're using in threat analytics, in doing all of the background checks of the customer, are no longer going to be valid because they are not classed as strong customer authentication and what you've got to do is provide a pop-up because everyone loves pop-ups and everyone loves entering little code numbers and dyna and seriously so the problem is is that uh, that standard was written first in 2011 and hasn't moved now the other challenge is is, is um, we've got comments in it's gone out for comment but I'm not sure how they're going to listen so quite how you're going to have to map this strong customer authentication into your systems, I honestly don't know, but it is going to be a challenge. So that one is coming through as well. There are other things in there. Um, <coughs> the interesting one of the interchange fee, the, the, the European regulators do wonderful things. So an interchange fee document you would think would be totally about interchange fees, except in there, they snuck in two requirements around the fact that um, the customer, cardholder, must be allowed to choose the application that they want to pay with. Now, in the UK, that's brilliant because we only have global schemes. So, yeah, I could pay with my Visa card, I could pay with my MasterCard. MasterCard, Master sorry. Uh, but in Europe, let's say I've got a carte bon care. Now, I want to pay with, do I want to pay with my global card or do I want to pay for my local card? So when I go in, I put my card in the chip card machine, it's going to pop up and say, here's your choices, which one do you want to pay with? That is. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do that for contactless. I've got 0.3 of a second. I'm not that quick. But that's the sort of thing they do. They put regulations in then and then say to us, well, go and work it out how to do it. So I would say... They're all available, those standards, on the internet. They're all available on the various European Council Commission websites. GDPR and PSD2 and the EBA RTS, do download them. They, you need to read them in more detail to realise the challenges that you are going to face. And you really are going to face some challenges. And the only good thing is, in terms of Brexit, is hopefully we will exit and then we can just wave goodbye to that PSD2 one. Um, unless you're all working for organisations that still have sales going on in Europe, in which case, good luck. <laughs> um, got a question at the back and then at the front. You, uh, you breezed over the encryption bit that you were talking about for end-to-end -end encryption. And I'd be a bit curious about that because we're obviously we're running into some of those difficulties and we're running into a lot of challenges with trying to get end-to-end -end encryption going between different entities and our own entity. What, how exactly are you going to be overpowering? Are you going to be light touch? How are you going to be with that? In terms of the encryption, so we have within the, the point between encryption process. So if one of the things we first set up when we first started doing point to point encryption was that we would have um, we would evaluate the whole solution so you have a basically the three parts to it you've got your terminal where the encryption occurs you've got the applications running through and then you've got the point where decryption occurs and that had to be one solution and the problem then with that was it locked people into various vendors which people didn't like so in version 2 one of the things we said was right we can recognize there are different manufacturers of point of sale terminal 
and, and there are some different manufacturers of HSMs and there's different people who can do that. So we now evaluate the solution. The solution and the requirements in the point-to-point -point encryption standard define the cryptographic levels and the key types and the various different methods you use. That will define the strengths. What about key management then? Key management is absolutely critical. It's the biggest part of it. In simple terms, it means that for the merchant to be able to gain the benefit of point-to-point -point encryption, they must not have any access to the keys. Because if they can access the keys, then they, the potential is that the criminal can gain access through, uh, gain access to the keys through the merchant and then decrypt it and therefore get the cardholder data. So it is about, I mean, key management is, is a very, very important part of it. Paul. So how that's managed, controlled, is all part of the evaluation and assessment. So you're, you're not going to be going into any detail about this, hopefully, because I mean, we're, we're finding it's trouble just to get the key management part sorted out. I mean, that, that's a huge, that's like 99% of our struggle right there. Because once you get that sorted out, then you've got tons of keys you've got to deal with. Yep. We're dealing with literally thousands of entities that we're, you know, we're counterparties. <laughs> and, and so, I am not a crypto expert, <laughs> so I'm going to bail on that one, because all I can say is absolutely, you know, what we, what we tend to do in, in the solution, there will be a KIF. And that KIF will be evaluated. So we, we get key entities, key centers, that we'll, man, we, we'll assess, audit, manage, and there, as part of that, will be the key management process. And how they then get those keys from there to the terminal, is also involved in that, and how they get that to the HSMs is already in that, is part of that. So that is defined. And that's as much detail as I can tell you, because that's as much detail as I know, and I appreciate that doesn't go into detail, but within the standards is the detail, if you want to have a look. So I'm sorry I can't go any better than that, that's the extent of my knowledge. One more question here. Hi, thanks. Um, I just wondered how would these uh, payment regulations would affect the Internet of Things payments, and specifically in terms of the frictionless for consumers, and secondly, um, the economics of the disposability element of it. Um, the last article I read was it would stop frictionless payments because you can't do single click, because you don't have strong customer authentication on a single <coughs> click. And that's the whole premise of the Internet of Things. Yes, payments. I know. That's what the, the Everybody, I, I've never heard, seen a united front provided by so many different organizations to the European Banking Authority to tell them just how big a mistake they've made. Um, we're waiting until January to see whether they've listened to us or not. But seriously, it's going to be a massive challenge for Uber, a massive challenge for any single click solution, a huge challenge for Amazon. And at the end of the day, what will probably happen is people will just ignore it. And then you get into an interesting situation, and, and this is because the European Banking Authority only, has, only deals with banks. It doesn't have a relationship with merchants or, or other entities. But then the, the banks themselves should then have a relationship through the issuing and the acquiring side eventually to the merchant that they should say you have to do this but I'm not quite sure who is going to be the people who come in and uh, police it because you've got a choice of the payment system regulator who doesn't do security because uh, they've said so and you've got the financial conduct authority who doesn't have anybody available so it's going to be one of those things where if you don't do it you'll probably get away with it until you have a problem and you get a breach or you get an issue and someone comes in and says, well, you weren't doing this, this, this and this and then they'll start giving you fines. But at the moment, the thing is, is just we wait until January to see what's going to happen. Uh, I wouldn't hold my breath with the EBA. Just funny book. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. That's thing, Jeremy. Any more questions? I can ask yep. Peters. 15-minute break for Peters. I need the tallest. Thank you.